Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today we're going to be going through Jude 16 through 19. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. The Greek translation of this is, these are complainers against their lot, ordering their course of conduct in accordance with their own passionate cravings, and their mouth speaks immoderate, extravagant things, catering to personalities for the sake of advantage. So in the preceding verses, Jude referred to harsh words, and now he elaborates on some of those harsh words. They are described as fate-blaming grumblers, those who discontently complain against God, those who are dissatisfied with their fate. The idea is not necessarily loud, outspoken dissatisfaction, but more of an undertone muttering. They are murmurers, constant gripers, never satisfied. William Barclay comments, quote, These are grumblers, forever discontented with the life which God has allotted to them. In this picture, he uses two words, one which was very familiar to his Jewish readers in one which was very familiar to his Greek readers. The first is a Greek word which describes the discontented voices of the murmurers and is the same as is so often used in the Greek Old Testament for the murmurings of the children of Israel against Moses as he led them through the wilderness. Its very sound describes the low mutter of resentful discontent which rose from the rebellious people. These wicked men in the time of Jude are the modern counterparts of the murmuring children of Israel in the desert, people full of sullen complaints against the guiding hand of God. In short, what Jude is doing here is giving us characteristics which should help us identify these snakes in our midst. They are boastful, pompous, haughty, grand, inflated, bombastic in their speech with the goal of pretentious, misleading, beguiling speech being to impress and entice. Mark it down. High sounding words make a great cover for false teaching. They impress people with their vocabularies and oratory, but what they say is just so much hot air. It is fascinating that the same expression is used in the Sepungent translation of Daniel 11.36 to describe the Antichrist's blasphemous utterances against God. Here is Brenton English's translation of the Greek translation for comparison. Quote, And he shall do according to his will, and the king shall exalt and magnify himself against every god and shall speak great swelling words, uses the same two words as Jude, and shall prosper until the indignation shall be accomplished, for it is coming to an end. This is an accurate description of the words of many liberal preachers and false cultists. They are accomplished orators, holding audiences spellbound by their grandiose rhetoric. Their vocabulary attracts undiscerning people. What their sermons lack in content, they make up for it in dogmatic, forceful presentation. But when they have finished, they have said nothing. The text goes on to say, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude uses the term of contrast as he changes direction shifting the focus from the denunciation of the apostates to loving exhortations to God's beloved saints. In the preceding section, the aim was to expose and condemn the evil men intruding into the churches. 
Here, the aim is to provide faithful believers with a strategy to combat the apostates effectively. Jude is asking the saints to allow back into their mind truths they had heard or been taught and to keep their mind alert and attentive to those truths. Why is it so important to remember truths spoken beforehand by the apostles? Because they reportedly warned of false teachers infiltrating the church and opposing the gospel. Jesus himself spoke beforehand warning, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The Apostle Paul gave many similar warnings, as did the Apostle Peter. While the Apostle John also warned about false teachers and false professors, his epistles were most likely not available to the saints as they were written about ten years later. Then the text goes on to say, How they told you, that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. The Weist Greek translation says, In the last time there shall be mockers ordering their course of conduct in accordance with their own passionate cravings which are destitute of reverential awe towards God. 2 Peter 3.3 says, Knowing this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. What were the mockers mocking? Well, 2 Peter 3, 4 makes it clear that these individuals ridicule and treat with contempt the Bible's repeated promise of Jesus' second coming, asking, where is the promise of his coming? Now, we accept the priority of 2 Peter and suggest that Jude had read that epistle shortly before he felt constrained to write this letter. As he wrote, Peter's prediction of the coming mockers was vividly recalled to his mind. The last time spoken of here refers to the end of the historical period that encompasses the church age and the tribulation. After this last time, God will rule directly over humankind, first during the millennium, and then in the new heavens and the new earth. It is the last time in relation to Jesus Christ's return to reign on the earth. Warren Worsby says, quote, Before Satan can substitute his own lies, he must get rid of the truth of God's word. If he cannot argue it away, he will laugh it away, and he can usually find somebody to laugh with him. Jude points out that nothing that has been observed about the false teachers should have taken the believers by surprise. The apostles had given warning that in the end times, evil deceivers would come among them. The description of the heretics as mockers indicates that one of their main tactics to gain credibility was to tear down godly leaders. And then it says these are sensual persons who caused divisions, not having the Spirit. The Apostle Paul alluded to divisions using a different verb in his parting address to the elders of the church at Ephesus, warning them that, from among your own selves men will arise, or crept in unnoticed, inside jobs, speaking perverse, corrupted, distorted, crooked things to draw away or lure away, attract away the disciples after them. Acts 20 verse 30. How or why will the disciples be drawn away? Clearly it is because they hear men they know and trust speaking attractive words which lure them away from the truth of God's word. Their appeal is usually, we have a deeper knowledge of the word that your church doesn't have. We have a better understanding of prophecy or of the Christian life than you do. They offer a higher quality religion than that of the apostles. Guzik says, quote, Sensual in this context has nothing to do with sexual attractiveness. It describes the person who lives only by and for what they can get through their physical senses, and they live this way selfishly. Their motto is, if it feels good, do it, or how can it be wrong if it feels so right? who cause divisions. 
These certain men had an instinct to separate themselves and make divisions. The word found only once in the Bible denotes those superior people who keep themselves to themselves. A sensual person is governed by sensual appetites and is living apart from the Spirit of God. Sensual is the opposite of spiritual. These men to which Jude refers think and act not like spiritual men, but like natural men. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. John MacArthur says, quote, These were religious frauds who paid lip service to faith and spiritual life, but denied such claims by their actions. As Paul told Titus, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Titus 1.16 In conclusion, brothers and sisters, because the false teachers, although Jude never specifically identifies them as such, do not have the Spirit of God, they may function on their natural soul power alone. One of the tragedies in ministry today is that some of God's people cannot discern between soul ministry and the true ministry of the Spirit. There is so much religious showmanship these days that the saints are confused and deceived. Just as there was a false fire in the tabernacle in Leviticus 10 verse 1, so there is a false fire today in the church. Therefore, we must exercise careful discernment. How can we discern between the soulish and the spiritual? By using the Word of God, which is able to divide soul and spirit, Hebrews 4.12, and by paying close attention to the witness of the Spirit of God within. A soulish ministry magnifies man, but the Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. When the Spirit is ministering through the Word, there is edification. But when the soul is merely manufacturing a ministry, there is entertainment, or at best, only intellectual education. It takes the Spirit of God to minister to our spirits and to make us more like Jesus Christ. Maranatha.